Question. Why are there so many scandals in the church? Have you noticed? Because there's humans in it. That's part of the answer. Got to be. The newspapers yeah. love a scandal in the church. The so newspapers love a scandal in the church. Sadly, they've often got too much to go on. Yeah? Yeah. Why is there so much superficiality in evangelicalism? People who say they believe the Bible. Why is there so much superficial? I came across a, a, a liberal, um, uh, living with his partner, Anglican bloke, um, the other day. He was, was talking on, I think it was through Twitter and stuff, he was talking about Jesus. Because he was coming across a lot of superficial evangelicalism where people talked about Jesus and he found it very cheesy. Why does that go on? Why is there so much nominalism? Why is there so much narcissism? Do you, do you use Twitter? Do you do use Twitter? No? Facebook? Yeah, nuts. Eat a little nuts. It's fine. <laughs> it depends what you do with it, you know? It's one of those things that, it's like a car. Uh, if you do certain things with it, it's good. If you do certain things with it, it's bad, isn't it? Um, crashing and things. So, uh, yeah, okay. So, why is there so much congratulation of people? Why is there so much fawning over influences? Why does this happen? Why is there so much inappropriate use of the word awesome? Does that annoy you? Man, it's really awesome. It's not. It's a song. It's a nice song. It's not awesome. It's my birthday thing. Man, it's really awesome. No, it's not. It's quite predictable. It happens according to the calendar. This is going to be. Yeah, it's not awesome. Why is there so much inappropriate use of the word awesome in Christian circles? Why is that? Today's song from the Book of Psalms is an awesome song, a song of awe, but it's dealing with something that you should be standing in awe of. And if, if perhaps if there were more awe, there'd be less awesome. Yeah. Now, it's a problem already, because we're sitting here thinking, yes, I know I should be in awe of God, I should be more in awe of God. Yes, that's bad as me, I really should be more in awe of God, right? How do I feel in awe of God? I, I, don't, I don't feel it, it's not there. And I'm sitting here in church and I'm bored actually. I don't know where he's going with this. And I'm bored. But how do you deal with that problem? How do you deal with that thinking, I know I should, but I don't feel in awe of God. Or I don't know how to sense or have, have a sense of the awesomeness of God. Well that's what we have to say, hang on a minute, because the psalmist is about to show you. Okay? That's what he's about, that's his business. Addressing that or deficit that we may sense and that is all too often evidence. Now it's really important to know before we go too far the context of this psalm. It is hugely the product of its time. So you must expect references to the pagan world. Okay? It is a hundred percent this psalm making points against pagan religions. There's a lot of paganism in this psalm but in a good way. Because he's picking up ideas and motifs, little pictures, all the time through the psalm, from what the pagan peoples around believed. And he's nicking their language and he's plundering it. And he's showing the awesomeness of God over against the puny things on offer in this world. And you're looking at that and you're saying, hang on, I can't see that. Well, of course you can't, that's why you're paying the answer on it. Okay? What's it all about? Do you know what these are? Do you know what these others? See these? No? People, I've got this lady from Facebook. Oh, it's a wordle. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm further back. It's a wordle, okay? It's a wordle. And a wordle is where you, there's a Java program runs on this website. You take a pile of text and you drop it into a wordle and it gives you a graphic representation of which words in that bit of text come up most often. Now, it's, it's, it's a rough guide, okay? But it's an indication of what Psalm 29 is about because I've taken. Take the Hebrew Psalm 29, haven't I? And I've pasted it all into this thing, and it's come up with the words that are the biggest and most emphasized and most regularly repeated word. And the biggest word on there is this fetching bit of beige here. <laughs> and this fetching bit of beige is the Hebrew word for Yahweh, the covenant name of God. Yeah. Yeah. The big stress there is on the holy name of the covenant keeping God. And all those effects in the life of the church that we started with 
can only arise when the name of the covenant-keeping God slips away from being large at the centre of the screen. Psalm 29 hasn't allowed him to slip away from being large at the centre of the screen. The covenant-keeping God. The God of the covenant. Yahweh, big, up front, centre, crucial. And he is in this psalm. The biggest word is the covenant name for God. And next comes the word kol, which means the voice. In this case, it's the voice. Guess who? God, he's big again. <laughs> it's the voice of God that's big in this psalm. Repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. The voice of God. The voice of God. The voice of God. You'll see how that's relevant shortly. And then comes the word for to God. Got it? Here it is. Here's God. Here's the word for to God. So he's back in there again. And it's all about worship to God. So it's about God, it's about the voice of God, and it's about worship to God. Yeah, making sense? We get somewhere? And then comes Haben, sons of. It's used of people and animals. I'm not clear why its numerical proliferation could possibly be significant. But what comes next is much more significant because the word that comes next that's um, big on the screen is this word here Kabbals. Kabbals. And that's the word for glory. God is big. Worship is to God. It's the voice of God that's creating the sense of awe and wonder. And what does it do? Everybody cries glory. Glory, glory, glory. So the psalm is all about the awesomeness of the voice of God and worshipping him for the effect of his voice in his world. Glory. It's a huge one. Okay. Happy days? Should we start and go? <laughs> Starts off an appeal, this psalm verses 1 to 2. Now, now get this, this is, you know, if anybody's against sort of emotion and stuff in preaching, if I get a bit carried away, you can sort of say, calm down, sorry. But, <laughs> but if anybody, like, they've never read a Bible, look at this, ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord! Glory and strength ascribe to the Lord. The glory in his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. <clears throat> ascribe to the Lord. You have any beings? Ascribe to the Lord. Glory. It doesn't work, does it? The guy's giving us some volume. And he's hammering, hammering, hammering. Ascribe to God. Ascribe to God. Ascribe to God. Glory you to his name. Worship him. Now, the, the major concerns of this appeal are colour coded for you. And they're plain obvious there, aren't they? And I know the NIV, in the NIV, the appeal is, is directed to you heavenly beings. The Hebrew has you sons of God, so what's going on? The ancient Near Eastern peoples had this idea that there were all these different gods, and they all sat in council around the great God. Right? Now, here's the psalmist, not afraid to pick up that sort of trash that's floating around in secular society or contemporary society. And, and plunder that and take it and, and take it forwards. Because, you know, <laughs> the psalmist does not believe in a multiplicity of gods. He believes in one God in three persons, right? So who's standing around in heaven then? Who's standing around in heaven worshipping God? There wasn't a tendency though to impart pagan gods to worship one another. There's a tendency though in scripture for there to be a heavenly council. And you're the great created beings that God has made. Worshipping him. So what's happening is that an idea from Ugarit, right? Ancient Hebrew, there you are, there's an alphabet for Ugaritic. If you thought Hebrew was hard, that's Ugaritic. Horrible, isn't it? So this buddy made a pattern of manuals. It does look like a lot of nails, <laughs> but they're writing with a stick on a bit of mud, you know. So there's a limit of the number of movements you can make, I suppose. I'm not sure how it works. He's taken this idea from this pagan world, he's hijacked it, he's filled it with biblical meaning. And that bunch of glorious angelic beings made by God himself, standing in the council of Israel's God, they're being called upon to ascribe to God all these characteristics of him. How do you worship God? What do you say to him? You pick up his glorious characteristics on this. You say, Lord, you are. Lord, you are. Lord, you are. 
and you ascribe to him his essential character, which is glorious. It's about him. Worship is about him. And, and as you recite the excellencies of his character, you come to stand in awe of his glory. That's important. And a nice new song comes out, isn't it? What's this doing in terms of worship in a biblical sense? Biblical worship ascribing to God. And in this case, his sovereignty, his glory, and his strength. He is the sovereign Lord. It's not like that Ugaritic situation where you've got this you know, chief God and all these tin pots around him. Kind of thing. This is, God is the sovereign Lord. And we'll see how he picks up and develops that later. Glory, strength, glory, you do Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Now hang on. When we worship God, what we do is we worship him. Yeah? Is that, uh, let's break this down to the basics. Right? We are worshiping him. Now, why is this psalmist then going to God and saying, going to these heavenly beings? Mm -hmm. we do that, do we? And he's saying, you lot, worship God. Why would that be? Why do they ask the heavenly beings to worship this awesome God? The way we do it is, is we go through words worship, we ascribe his character to him. That's how we do it. There is a tendency, isn't there, with our worship songs, and contemporary worship songs particularly, to use, well, we have a tendency to put ourselves in the position of saying what we want to do in worship. Have you noticed that? I want to sing. I want to praise you. you know? um, what's that one that we had a little while ago? Uh, take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. That's great, that's good. That's fine. Um, we tend to talk about what we want to do. But here's what's happening in this, is that other superior beings are called upon to worship this awesome God. And that's a big contrast. And it's a call on those other beings to worship this awesome God by those who themselves want to worship God. They want to join in to God in worship. The psalm used up the temple for temple worship. Why is that? It, it looks as if the reason implicit in this is that these heavenly beings are called upon to worship this awesome God. Because in the presence of the awesome Lord, human beings sense their inadequacy, their insufficiency and their sin even to worship Him. There's that sense of standing back, a sense of, He is the most amazing God and I can't do that. So it's as if the psalmist is calling on those who are able to worship Him in the splendour of His holiness to do so. And that becomes relevant when we get to the end of the psalm. But just notice for the moment. This isn't, Lord, I want to praise you. This is, you heavenly beings who might be fit for it because you've got the splendor of his holiness on. Will you worship him? Because he must be praised. Hold on to that for a bit. There's the appeal. Ascribe credit to God in worship, His glory, His strength. But I don't feel fit to do that. You heavenly beings, you must stand in awe of God. I don't sense it. I don't feel it. And then this psalm moves on from that point into like a meditation. The main section of the psalm is in verses 3 to 9. Verses 3 to 9. Tonight. Here it comes. This is the awe-inspiring bit. Here's where the mind gets focused on the things about God that give rise to an appreciation of His glory. You've got to focus. Uh, by the way, did anybody see my blog this week? Thank you for saying yes, no. Okay. Anybody seen it yet? Did you see that there's... Ah, oh, Mike's got it. Yeah, yeah, anyway. Feel a little bit better. Um, my, my blog this week's all about um, an introduction. Well, it's, it's about lion taming for beginners. Uh, so, if you want to do a bit of lion taming, have yeah, a little look, because there's a... There's a you have read it, have you? <laughs> there's an introduction there to lion taming and how you do it. Now, of course, I suppose the trouble is, these days, who's, who's been to a circus with lions in it? Admit your age. <laughs> you admit, well, you won't be able to admit in it, Tom, do you mean? <laughs> because we don't do circuses with lions anymore. It's considered the cruel and so on, you can understand. But you're kind of from, I suppose. But, but what used to happen 
was somebody go in the ring, this whip, and it would be full of lions, and they will go, Arr! you know. Uh, and then, every now and again, I suppose, a lion tamer would get eaten. Uh, which, which was the appeal of the whole thing in the first place. We'd go along and we were going to get some lion tamers eaten. You know. uh, when we were up in Kent, and we were living up there, working up there, um, there was a particular zoo not so far away, and they seemed to feed keepers to tigers on a regular basis. Um, it's a terrible thing. But, but the breakthrough in lion taming in the world came with a guy called Clyde Beatty uh, from Ohio. And uh, he'd go into the ring to face these lions. He'd have a whip, of course, everybody's looking at the whip, but he had a chair as well. He had a chair with him. A four leg, you know, one of these. Right? Like that. And he'd go, lighter than that, and he'd go in the ring with his chair. And you're thinking, what's he doing with the chair? Do you want to sit down? What's that all about? You're not going to hurt a lion with the chair, are you? What happens with a lion is he gets very confused because he's looking at four legs on the chair. And he can't decide which leg to do something about. So he's distracted with all these things going on all around him. And therefore, he's so busy being distracted with all this and not knowing what to do next, so confused and distracted, he doesn't attack. Clever, isn't it? Clyde Beatty lived into his 60s, didn't die of lion, he died of cancer in the end, sadly. So, you know, it obviously works, doesn't it? Distraction. Now, the psalmist is, is having a focus. Because it's distraction that's led him away from a grasp on the awe that does belong to God, that he should have for God, and that should be driving his worship. It's the distractions of everything going on around him, and not focusing that's lost him. His sense of awe of God. God isn't big, large, middle front of the screen. See? What we need to do is to identify the big issue. Focus our gaze on those big issues. And if your thoughts are never on God and never on his works, he himself, then your thoughts are never going to be on his awesomeness and your worship will be dutiful and it will be dry. If, if you're struggling with this thought that we ought to be in awe of him, we, we know he's deep down awesome, we don't ever seem to encounter much of a sense of that, then you need to ask serious questions of quite where it is that your mind is spending time. Because he's an awesome God and has seen his work. Meditate, says this worship leader, the psalmist. Fix your mind on something. Gaze quietly, attentively, thoughtfully. Ponder. It is never a waste of time to stop, gaze and ponder on the works of God. But ponder what? Ponder what inspires awe of God and worship. So here comes one of those very common words from our word of analysis. Call. Oh. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. God is over the waters, verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> you, can't, you can't see the psalm, so put that in a minor key, can you? It's one of those dreamy ballads, is it? This is a power ballad. He's got something going here. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Boom. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a sea scene on a windy day, isn't it? Crashing breakers. Yep, God is over the waters. Yep, but listen, this is getting really important. Not his sweat and effort, but his mere command. His voice. His word of command. Does it all. Man, does it get important in the New Testament? That's a digression. Let's be clear what's going on here. <clears throat> Somebody asked me at the Sandalo show last week, and we had a stand at the show. He asked, she asked me a deep theological question, which I gave a slightly evasive answer, which I'm not in the habit of doing, but it wasn't the time or place. It was to do with the direction of rainfall before the fall. I didn't consider it was a big issue to give time to, to be honest. And I, I, I did manage to say, well, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's very important we concentrate on the big issues, keep the big issue the big issue, because otherwise we get distracted, and you know, the devil's not going to use us very powerfully if we're distracted all the time, is it? But the, the, the God isn't going to use us, the devil can distract us all the time. The importance of keeping the big issue the big issue, keeping the main thing the main thing. She was asking me about the waters and God being over the waters and the direction of the waters. The point is... God is over the waters. Now, what does that mean? 
what is the biblical view of creation? Please. You can go on and you can ask me a question or also need some tea. What is a biblical view of creation? Where will you take me to? Thank you. This is help. Marvellous. Help from a visitor. Fantastic. Good. Uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 1 to 2. That's where we go. Yeah. But there is so much. I haven't had my tea. <laughs> It's too good, it's too quick, and get my tea. So, <clears throat> so here's the thing. We go for a biblical view of creation of Genesis 1 and 2. Of course we do, because there's been this big argument with all these atheists about it. So that's what's up in our minds, isn't it? There is so much more about creation, so much more to a biblical view of creation in the rest of the Bible. So many other ways of understanding it as well. Because Israel's expression of its understanding of creation it shows how they were not very indebted to current notions in the ancient world. See, one of the ways the Old Testament describes creation, creation is through a conflict between Yahweh, the divine name of God, and the sea. There's this conflict between God and the sea. And you think, what, 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 doesn't he like the beach? What, what's going on? Sea, in the ancient Near East, was a symbol of chaos. It, there were sea monsters, Leviathan, Rahab, and so on. And sea is a symbol of chaos. And God's victory in the conflict establishes order in creation. Here's a way they thought of creation. The people around them were thinking of creation in, in terms of a cosmic battle between one of the tin pot gods and this god, the sea. And, and Israel comes steaming in behind and says, no, 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 no. There's not some big strenuous battle. God brings disorder, symbolized by your idea about the sea and so on, into chaos. Uh, no, chaos is the symbol. Okay. Brings order into chaos. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Of course you do. You know all this, don't So here's what's going on. God is over the sea because sea is the chaos monster. And instead of this big battle that Marduk or whoever it is has to have in the ancient Near Eastern myths, God just speaks and brings chaos in creation to it's a poetic way of doing it. Buying in on their language and their culture and everything else to show the supremacy and the sovereignty of Israel's God of speaks. And it's done. Lots of examples of that. Psalm 104, verse 7. Psalm 89, verse 10. Psalm 74, verses 13 to 14. I don't know why I'm going backwards through the psalm. That, but there we are. Sea is a symbol of chaos, and so Yahweh's victory in the conflict establishes order. He is the creator, he's the supreme power, power, he's the conquering king, he's the sovereign lord, and Israel's proper response is not an argument with somebody who believes in evolution. Israel's proper response is awe and wonder and praise. For the ancient Near Eastern pagan people, you can understand it living almost landlocked in Palestine, not being a seafaring nation like the Philistines. There are these vast, powerful, awesome, destructive forces that work in the surging sea. Seems so chaotic, seems so malevolent and threatening. And they imagine these forces in their myths uh, to be the work of this chaos monster deity, let loose in creation, and the point that's being made here is this, go down to the beach, stare out to sea at the height of a winter's gale. You see that power? You see that energy? You see that destructive force venting its spume, crashing angrily into the sands? Not even his little finger, but the mere voice of God, the sovereign of the Lord, the God of glory thunders, the Lord thunders, over the mighty waters. You see, you see what's behind all of that? He speaks and they are still. And then of course the sun comes in inland uh, over the, uh, there you are, there's a picture of uh, Marduk in, in the sea. Okay. The vision of the sun comes inland. It comes inland from the seaboard, it comes into the northwestern area, into the land of the forest to Lebanon, Syria. The voice of the Lord, verse 5, breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon, smashed trees. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks, strips forests bare. What's this force? What's this power? See, what the context describes here on the cedars and the oaks is the effect of very high winds on big trees. Breaking in pieces the cedars of Lebanon, twisting the oaks, a dense timber that tends to twist and rip rather than break into pieces. The psalmist has lived in his environment, he's observed it, he's taken time to think about it. 
Now there's a word in Hebrew for, for the wind, the breath, the spirit of God. That word is ruach, literally breath, breath or wind. It is not the word that's used here. This is not the wind that blows up the wind pipe and rattles the cords in the throat. This, it seems to me, is actually the voice, the power to communicate of the sovereign God. And he speaks with such power. He reveals himself. He smashes the mighty cedars of Lebanon with his voice. Cedars of Lebanon, prized, uber-resilient building materials. And he speaks with such power that his very voice wrenches and twists the limb from the mightiest of oaks and strips bare the forest where his voice runs. These represent the strongest materials in the whole of creation in that day. Here's your 40 Newton concrete. Right? Here's your carbon fibre. Here's your graphene of the day. And God's voice smashes it. Such is his voice. Such is his authority. Such is his sovereign, awesome power. When were you last out in the storm at night? That's just our puny little storms. Not the stuff that rip off the, off the sort of eastern Mediterranean and, and chunder down the, the, the sort of start of the rift valley, isn't it? The valley of the jaw. Ripping through. So there are these great symbols of strength. Cedars and oaks, the mountains of the northwest. God is not only over the forest up there, he's over the landmass, verse 6. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. Have you been into Lebanon? Have you seen the mountains? You're standing in the valley and you look up and there are these snow-capped peaks. Rock, solid, powerful, strong, immovable. The mountains of Lebanon, Syria, where you find Mount Hermon, it's a really mountainous area. So there are these great symbols of strength, cedars and oaks and the mountains of the northwest. And those great immobile mountains of Lebanon skip like startled calves at the mighty voice of God. Have you seen a calf skip? I've seen one jump. <laughs> yeah, we've had a bit of jumping through fences recently, haven't we, guys? <laughs> It hasn't been a good week in our place for cattle and fences, I'm afraid to say. However, yeah, but, you know, a bull doesn't move like that. One of the big old cows doesn't move like that. But a calf comes out and its power to weight ratio is such that, boy, they can skip! Young cattle are jumping. They start a lot easier. And being light on their feet, they jump about much more dramatically. And these big symbols of stability in ancient Near Eastern literature, the mountains of Lebanon, skip at the sound of the voice of Israel's awesome God. Think the earthquake, think the power of the earthquake. What's going on there? The voice of God speaks. And the mountains leap like a calf. God is over the storm, verse 7. I'm skipping that so much the pagan background here. I'm sure you're relieved. But I've got to bring it in at this point, because this is a really relevant issue. You've heard of Baal, right? You've heard of the Baals. You've heard about Elijah and all the prophets of Baal. And the rest of it, yeah. Kicking around God in the ancient Near Eastern world. He was the ancient Near East weather god, a bit like Derek the weatherman, you know? So there he is, <laughs> directing the weather and hurling the thunderbolts, yeah? You don't watch Welsh television less, I'll get any funny. Sorry about that. I'll explain when we come to you. They believed that he was the one who hurled the lightning bolts. He was the rider of the storm. Baal, our pagan god. In fact, Baal is depicted in, in, in Ugaritic iconography, wielding lightning like a weapon in his hand. He's got to get in there and do battle with the lightning and all stuff. But again, he's got a big heavy sword that he has to get down and personal with. He has to work and wield it. And without for one moment accepting even the existence of these pagan gods, the psalmist here picks up that iconography and he invades it and he declares by the simple exercise of his voice, Israel's awesome God does not ride but directs and commands the storm, this awesome force of nature, by his voice. See the point? God is over the storm. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashing of lightning. And God is over the desert in the wilderness in verse 8. Now there's a lot of talk about this, this word for desert, Midbar. Um, strictly speaking, it's not like Lawrence of Arabia, you know, sandy deserts and dunes, um, ice creams, not that stuff. Um, it's like the unpopulated semi-arid lands, probably. 
but there's not much debate about where it is, whether it's the southern deserts, I think probably it's all the northern deserts, we don't really know, but it's the unpopulated areas. It says there the des desert of Kadesh, but even that, the desert of Kadesh, Kadesh is in the south, but, but it looks like it could actually be the word for holy, the holy desert. The voice of the Lord shakes the holy desert. Remember the holy desert. Historically, God led his people into the desert when they wandered away. He led them into the desert to, to, to woo them and to bring them back to himself so they could learn his ways again and go off and live for his glory. Place of God's presence in the desert. Well, who knows? God's word, God's voice seems to work where there is stuff and where there isn't stuff. It works there awesomely. So, there's the meditation. There's been a tremendously strong emphasis in that, hasn't there? On the sheer sovereign power of the voice of God. The voice of God. Um, one of my green friends, um, I chat, still chat with a lot on Facebook, um, he, he was, he's got sort of an RAF background, and he's sort of, he's still got all that in, but he's trying to be very green now. And, uh, fair enough, uh, and he was off recently to an air show uh, down in the south of England, uh, also by somewhere. I think. You know the show down there? And there was this great thrill and enthusiasm because there was going to be a Vulcan bomber. Yeah? Vulcan bomber. Do you remember Vulcan bombers? So you were so young. No, I was I remember being a kid at, at an air saying, I think an air show. And over the top came this Cold War bomber, right? A Vulcan bomber. Now listen to me. When that thing, when that thing goes at your chest, rattles, okay? It is a big, awesome beast. And, and the voice of this thing, as it flies over your chest, just rattles in your body. Awesome. And I said, text Facebook chase, I said, oh man, you know, did you feel your chest rattle? <laughs> did you feel your chest? Because the voice of, imagine what the voice of God then is like, this is just bomber. If God unleashed his voice, your, eye, your, your, your chest, chest would rattle, your eyes would pop, wouldn't they? <laughs> and everything hearing, seeing the effect of that voice in creation. In his temple all cry glory. Now look, the scene has shifted. And it's still a bit of geography. <coughs> At the beginning, the psalmist is sitting there twiddling his thumbs thinking, oh, I ought to be in order of God. I don't know I should really, because I'm a proper evangelical, but I'm not. And then he goes off on this sort of transit through the Holy Land, probably off the sea and into the northern seaboard and down the valley as the wind and the voice of God rips down the rift valley and into the desert. Okay? And once he arrived, he's arrived in a situation where he's in the temple, which is an earthly place. It, it's not the council of God. He's now in the earthly temple as a human being. And he's saying, meditating, seeing the great glory of the voice of God, the impact of his voice in creation. The sovereign Lord speaks, and that happens in the world. The exercise of that power prompts human beings to worship in his temple. Do you see what's happened? Do you see the direction the psalm has taken? That's why we're boring you with that bit at the beginning. Yeah. Because all of a sudden he finds himself having thought through and put centre and centre stage the awesomeness of the voice of God and its impact on creation. All of a sudden he has a sense of awe and worships with the other people in the temple. Does that make sense? You can say no, it's all right, I will get upset, but you know, I'll just have to live with it. <laughs> Here's where we've come to. We've come to that point by verse 9, having taken our minds to those issues of the sovereign power of the voice even of God. We've come to the point where all in his temple just you're looking confused. Can I help? It's not confused, is it? It's just a headache. Okay. <laughs> so then they are in the temple and they all cry glory. Cobbles. Why cobbles? It looks a bit like a wild consecutive construction, but you don't want to know that. Because in this context, it's purpose that's indicated. They all cry glory. Glory, because they've heard about God's rule exercised by his voice and the impact of that in creation. Because of that, they all cry, all in his temple, meditating on the awesome power of God, which is there if they were concentrating and focusing on it, they all then cry glory. Now, if you never do that, if there is no awe, if there is no awesome, because your mind does not consider and your eyes do not see the glory, well, there ain't going to be any awe, there ain't going to be any glory, and there ain't going to be any praise. There'll be duty, 
They'll be saying what we think we ought to say, but there ain't going to be any prayers. He's not so worried now, is he, about you know, whether he's clothed in you know, garments of holiness, is he? The beauty of holiness. He's not worried about that now. He's just overcome. He's overcome with the awesomeness of our God. From despair and an earthly human inability to worship, which leads to the appeal of the heavenly council to worship him, because they're the ones that are clothed in the beauty of his holiness and he's not. The meditation on this awesome, sovereign, self-revealing God has affected this fundamental change. And that meditation rings worship out of a previously stagnant, moribund, non-awe-inspired, sinful human heart. In his temple now, all, all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned in all the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Can't help himself. He's seen the works of the victorious, great, glorious, sovereign Lord who puts down these pagan deities as the tosh that they are and reigns by his word of command. He's spoken. And therefore he sits enthroned over the defeated forces of cosmic chaos, enthroned over the flood presides as the great king over judgment on sin and idolatry and is enthroned forever. And no future conflict because he's enthroned forever between presumed deities is ever going to bring him down the way they thought it did in the ancient Near East in those days. His sovereignty is secure. He reigns, he rules, and he does so like a faithful king. Not a king who preys upon his people, but as a king who rules to give strength to his people rules to give his people peace. How would you conclude that then? <laughs> yeah, don't look back at me and say carry on, because it's not as easy as that. What do I have to do? This God's an awesome God. Just open your eyes and see it. We're surrounded by people who do not see that our God is an awesome God. They don't see it because they're not looking. And you try and point them where you ought to be looking and see that he's an awesome God. And they say, no, that's outside the rules of the game. Failure to feed our minds, let alone his. Failure to feed our mind on his awesome splendor. What it breeds is spiritually stagnant, non-worshipping, moribund followers. Followers who aren't following at all who turn up for the 40-minute monologue on a Sunday. And don't throw cabbage. That's a miracle, isn't it? Get your cabbage away. <laughs> Reaching in the back of your wheelchair, I saw you. How do you get to the right place? It's a matter of feeding your mind on his splendour, as opposed to the alternatives. Remember the lion in the chair. Finally, and I've laboured this, please notice the absolute importance of hearing the voice of the Lord, seeing the voice of the Lord, because the voice of the Lord is how he gets things done his voice. And all those ancient Near Eastern gods, and, you know, these referring to and saying God has triumphed over all the rest of it, they had to sweat and struggle and battle and... It's the voice, just the voice. He just speaks. Speaks and it's done. In all our business with outreach, outreach methods appropriate to our culture and all the rest of it, our time, our situation, it's right, it's proper, it's good, let's never forget how our God gets things done. It's his voice. He speaks, and it's that he's the one, the one, who speaks, and he's done. Awesome? Man, it's really awesome. But it is. We should worship our listeners.